Mercy me. Moody Radio Cleveland, WCRF. You may be wondering, you know, is my vision of Christmas, what I picture in my head of the Christmas story of Jesus, is it accurate? Probably not. <laughs> no, it's probably wrong. In fact, uh, joining us now to give us an accurate picture, theologically speaking, of Christmas, everyone's favorite co-editor of the Moody Bible Commentary, friend of the show, it's been a while, Dr. Mm-hmm. Michael Van Landingham, welcome back. Brian, how are you? Doing better now that you're here, brother. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, I am the favorite co-editor. Forget Rodelnik. I it's me. I'm everybody's favorite, <laughs> so just had to say that. And again, I, I'm convinced one of the reasons it's so thick, the, the the commentary itself, is just to fit your name on on the binding. <laughs> yeah, I was in college before I could figure out how to spell my name, actually. So yeah, it's a challenge, but it, it's very it's very long, but it is wonderfully phonetic. Van Lan Ing Ham. It's not that hard, really. And, and you mm-hmm. get two capital letters. That's no fair. Actually, that's not right. It's all one word. Oh, really? That L thought... is not capitalized. Oh, oh wow. Ooh. Scratch that yeah. off my writing here on our it's paperwork. Right. We'll, we'll still we'll still be friends. It's okay. You know, Close one. But, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if people will be friends with us after we uh, change Christmas in their minds here. <laughs> uh, but I want to get it the accurate. So I, we did this a number of years ago, and I loved it. People thought it was interesting. So let's just go through some preconceived ideas about Christmas and see what's accurate. Uh, first one. I regularly hear from pastors that Mary was a teenager when she uh, became pregnant. Is that accurate? Uh, We don't know how old she was, but um, it was very common for women uh, to get married in their early to mid-teens and for uh, men to marry them in their late teens. And so it's quite possible she was 14 to 17 or 18 years of age. Uh, that's that's really quite likely, as a matter of fact. Is that a noteworthy point, S- seeing that it was so culturally common? Well, what I think is noteworthy is that the Lord would use um, a woman in her teens to do this. Yeah. I, I mean, that's extraordinary. I think it says, no doubt, a very great deal about Mary, but also a very great deal about God, that he is willing and able to use people who who might not be all that socially prominent or whatever uh and and to be a teenage woman back in those days was probably not very socially prominent and so i think it's i I think it's quite amazing that um that she was of the kind of character that god would approach her and that she would agree to do such a thing oh my goodness we think of the potential shame involved as an unmarried woman, because she was unmarried at this point, she was betrothed to, J- to Joseph, but she was—they were not married. And so, what she's doing here is exposing herself to enormous uh, social shame. And she did it so, like, without hesitation. She just like let it be so. Yes, I mean, imagine the submissive heart that she had. Now, of course, she was engaged to a guy, uh, Joseph Carpenter. I'm picturing him: saws, nails, hammers. Uh, bu- building homes. Is that is that fair? Uh, he probably did some of that, but the word for um, for carpenter, or, or the word that's translated carpenter, is a word that really means construction worker. Oh. And so um, uh, somebody who did construction. And so it's quite possible that he not only would have built homes, um, but he probably would have done it out of stone. And he might have made furniture. That's a possibility. But there wasn't a lot of wood available. And so he was uh, probably gifted in some aspects of stone masonry, stone construction, as well as some things related to wood. Okay, so I'm picturing, you know, if we're fast forwarding, he was going to quietly divorce her, like end the engagement. Nope. Uh, Angel appears to him. So he, you know, they're like, well, let's go for the let's go for the census. We're headed to Bethlehem. We'll just put Mary up here on this donkey, and we're going to ride all the way to Bethlehem. Possible. Uh, of course, the text doesn't mention a donkey. It's oh. it's possible that uh, that there was. Uh, it's possible that she walked that far. They may have had a cart, maybe, maybe that that an animal would pull. But uh, donkeys were uh, sort of like Buicks back in that day (laughs) and um uh, mary and joseph we know were of extremely modest means we know that because when jesus was brought up to the temple to be offered there in the temple and dedicated in the temple 
uh, just after his birth, they offered two turtle doves, and and two turtle doves was the offering of poor people. Oh, I didn't. So, that. so yeah, it's possible that they might have had a donkey, but it's possible Mary might have walked the eighty-five miles or so from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. Now they wouldn't have done it in one day. They would have taken their time, and we don't know f- quite how far along she was in her pregnancy. Uh, I doubt that she got to Bethlehem and then that night gave birth. It it, it does say something different from that in Luke's gospel. So, uh, but we really don't know exactly what it was, uh, how how she or they were t- uh, transported down there. Now, you you just hinted at the next thing. So, I'm I, she's walking. Maybe who knows how she gets there? Probably walking. Maybe riding something. She arrives, you know, the local hotel is full because, come on, everyone's back for the census. Uh, and she quick runs into a, a barn and gives birth next to the cows. Uh, yeah, it's not quite like that, uh, probably. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really interesting in Luke chapter 2. Um, it says, while, we were, uh, while they were there, okay, so they got to Bethlehem. And they were there a little while. We don't know how long. Oh, really? But while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the... And then there's a word. In. The word that's used there in Greek is um, katalama. And katalama actually means guest room. So Mary and Joseph are leaving from Nazareth because of the census that's being taken so that the Romans can more accurately uh, tax Israel. And they have to go down to an ancestral home, so they go down to Bethlehem. Probably they go to the house of a relative of Joseph's. And um, when they get there after a while, she gives birth. But there was no room for them, not in the inn, but in the guest room. That's what kataluma means, is guest room. And so there's probably a room in this house where people might have stayed if they were visiting. Um, and it was full. The house was full because everybody was going back to their ancestral homes. And so there wasn't room there. Other people were taking what would have been the guest room. So what do Mary and Joseph do? They go to uh, what's probably adjacent to that home, which is where also the animals are being kept. Uh, it's like what we would think of as our garage. And so uh, there Jesus is actually born. And I think maybe they went in there because there was privacy, because she, they, you know, they could be alone rather than have all these people around while the birth is taking place. Now, the text doesn't say that, but that's just a guess on my part. There's another word for in in the Bible. In Luke 10, 34, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he takes a person who had been beat up by the side of the road, and he takes him to an inn. That's a different word. Oh. than Cataluma. And so uh, we know that that's really not the best translation in Luke chapter 2. So is it possible that for the journey to Bethlehem, she may not have been as pregnant as we all imagine? It's possible. Maybe she was six months pregnant. Maybe she was seven months pregnant. We don't know how long it was that they were in uh, in Bethlehem before she gave birth. Again, Luke 2, two six. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. It doesn't quite sound like she arrived and then four hours later gave birth. And so that could also possibly allow them to tidy up a bit in the barn. I mean, people sometimes want to make it sound like it's all nasty in there, but it may not have been. Oh, it might not have been, but it, but it does say that um, when, uh, when Jesus was born— uh, Mary and Joseph laid him in a manger, and the word the word manger there really means um, manger, and it's a manger is a trough out of which animals eat their food. Oh, and also we know that at least some of the mangers in uh, the Holy Land were made out out of stone uh, because the animals could chew wood apart, and so this is, it was very likely, very possibly made out of stone, and so Jesus is taken, probably he's all wrapped up. But he's laid in a trough out of which animals eat. You think about just the, the, um, how do I say it? The submissiveness of Jesus, the humility of his, his parents. And what an amazing way to come into the world. Where did, where did Jesus go? He went where there was room. He went where, uh, he was welcomed. And, and he doesn't bust down the doors to go yeah. somewhere to be born. You know, it's, it's, it's like that. And, and so we have to keep in mind that um, Jesus still doesn't bust down doors, but 
he will come where he is welcome. And I hope, I hope everybody listening to us will welcome Jesus Amen. If uh, into their heart, that they would trust him by faith if they haven't already, um, because otherwise Jesus isn't going to go knocking down walls to go into a person's life. Yeah, he's, he's not the Kool-Aid man. Uh, no, he's not. Now, Brian, you know, there's not too many people are going to understand that. And <laughs> to the young people. Do yeah, you know the, that the one? young people, I would yeah. say, what's oh, yeah. Kool-Aid, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> he used to bust through the wall, I think. I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. But that's right. not like Jesus. Yeah, exactly. Okay, it is 848. Time for a quick break. Our guest is Dr. Michael Van Lanningham, co-editor of the Moody Bible Commentary. When we come back, there's more to discuss to ensure that we have a theologically correct vision of what Christmas really was like. Christmas music right here on WCRF's Mornings with Brian. That's Tori Kelly. It's 852, and talking about a theologically correct Christmas with us is Dr. Michael Van Lanningham, co-editor of the Moody Bible Commentary. We've been going through our preconceived notions of the Christmas story and getting an accurate picture of this. Uh, you know, so we get to the point of Jesus being born. You talked about the manger. Now, if the hymn is correct, very soon thereafter, three kings from Asia showed up. Yes, we three kings of Orient are bearing gifts we traverse afar. Okay, that 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 Christmas carol is perfectly accurate, except for except for the fact that they probably weren't kings, that there probably weren't three of them, and they probably weren't from weren't from the Orient. Aside from that, <laughs> the thing is perfectly accurate. You know, so so we're talking about magi from the east, and we don't know actually. We don't. We don't really, there's not really a consensus on who these guys were. You know, it could be they were Zoroastrians. It's possible that they were Jewish people still living in, in Persia, you know, in what would have been considered Persia at the time. We, we, we really don't know. We don't know if they saw the star when they were in the east or they were somewhere and then they saw the star in the east. We don't really know. And I got to say one thing about this. I, I had uh, an astronomy class. Astronomy, by the way, is the science. Astrology is the religion. And <laughs> Lest so astron- someone be concerned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so astronomy, and it was a great class. And and uh, but our our professor, who was not a Christian guy, but he's a really good guy, um, actually gave a presentation in class one day as we were approaching Christmas about the alignment of certain stars and comets in the sky and that this was probably what the wise men saw when they came. The problem is, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 9, it says, after hearing the king, this is referring to the Magi now, they went their way. And the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Notice this. The star went, it came, and it stood. And what I want to suggest is that this thing moved around, which is what, which is not something that's going to happen if, if we're talking about an alignment of certain stars and planets or comets or something in the sky. But this actually moved around. And um, Radelnik thinks, my good friend Michael Radelnik thinks, and I think rightly so, that this is probably the glory of God. And it's interesting, the glory of God as a bright light moved around in the Exodus, to show wow. the people of God where to go. I mean, at night it was a it was fire, during the day it was a pillar of smoke, but but it was nevertheless a manifestation of the glory of God that moved around, that guided people, and it seems to me that we have a perfect reason to think that that's exactly what was happening here as well. And you know, as we um, we're getting just a few minutes away from our our time wrapping up, I want to be sure, as much as I could ask you lots more questions. Uh, we got to talk about like the point of the story. Like, why does the nativity, the you know Luke chapter two, Matthew chapter one, why does that matter? Well, what we have here is a fulfillment of um, promises in the Old Testament. You know, I think of Isaiah chapter seven and verse fourteen, which which prophesies that a virgin will conceive, will give birth to a son, and he's going to. You know, in, in Isaiah 9, in the same context as Isaiah 7, there's a connection there between the two chapters, uh, that it's God with us, um, God coming to dwell with us. And um, in, in Luke, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, the angel appears to Mary, says, You have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, bear a son, you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, will be called the Son of the Most High. 
The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Just exactly what was promised to King David, that David would have a son who would secure Israel, lead Israel, save and rescue Israel, prosper Israel, and uh, enlarge Israel's boundaries. And so Jesus, bef- I mean, when he is conceived in Mary, um, it's, it's prophesied to her that he is fulfilling what was said in the Old, in the Old Testament. And so there's, there's so much at stake, God's faithfulness, God's kindness in um, coming to rescue not only Israel, but we also know the Messiah is there for the entire world. And so it's a, it's a glorious thing that he's done for us. How likely is it that it was December 25th, by the way? Oh, you know, we just don't know. Um, we, we know that Herod the Great uh, dies in um, March and uh, at a date somewhere between March and April. Oh. And um, it's, it's really hard to say just exactly when it takes place. There's a lot of evidence on all kinds of sides, you know, whether it was in the spring or in the fall or in, around Christmas. We really plain just don't know. And ultimately, it's not important. It really isn't. What's important is that the event happened. Now, what about this one? A couple of Christmas carols indicate, like, Jesus is this perfect little baby that doesn't cry. Like, he's just, nothing phases him because he's, you know, he's God. Right. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Exactly. Well, he, would be, he would be the first baby on the face of the earth would be quiet upon birth, you know? <laughs> Plus also then, that's also when the little drummer boy s- shows up and starts pounding on the drum, he'll start crying then, you know, which also the little drummer boy, that's a myth too, you know. So, uh, so I think that's rather, I think that's rather unlikely. You know, we have this I- idealized view and, you know, and Mary's crying, ah, ah. She's probably going, ah, ah, you know, and <laughs> yeah. she's giving birth there rather than, than just this calm little thing that's happening. And, and yeah. I don't know why we do those things, but you're right, you're right. It certainly has been helpful uh, to get this theologically correct view of Christmas from our good friend, Dr. Michael Van Lanningham. You hear him regularly on Chris Fabry with Dr. Rydelnik. He also, you can hear him on a regular basis on Open Line on Saturdays. And of course, he's the commentator and co-editor of the Moody Bible Commentary. Get that wherever you get your books, or of course, you can get it at moodypublishers.com. Thank you so much for your time and expertise, my friend. Brian, it's always a pleasure, man. Have a Merry Christmas and all your people, and God bless all of you. You too, brother. All right, it's just about 9 o'clock. That does it. Hmm. God bless us, everyone. That's from your favorite movie, right? Which version's I, your favorite? I, it, it's not my favorite, but I do like it. Um, it's hard to say. There's so many of uh, A Christmas Carol that are out. Well, we're going to have to uh, talk about favorite movies and such later this week, and mm-hmm. least favorite movies, <laughs> which Ron is wrong on that as well. Uh, but for now, we got to get running here because our good friend J.D. Greer is going to preach, and we'll talk to you on a Tuesday morning.